the wonderful love of Jesus. I had two young men and two young preachers in my office this past week, and what a testimony they are. It was a great joy to have Nikki Cruz and Sonny Argonzoni in my office. Nikki Cruz was the Mama gang leader, gave his heart to Christ. He'd been saved 30 years in preaching. He was the, uh, one of the key characters in the Cross and Switchblade uh, story. And Sonny Argonzoni was the first drug addict uh, we reached for the Lord when we came to New York City three years ago. Nicky was on his way to a crusade in London. He travels all over the world preaching to thousands, and I'll never forget how the love of Jesus touched him. I, every time I go past Fort Greene Projects here in Brooklyn, I get a lump in my throat. I was 115 pounds, 28 years old. But feeling the love of Jesus just rushing to me that Jesus had for drug addicts, alcoholics, prostitutes. And I walked into this city and I uh, drove in rather 1957 green Chevrolet, slept in the car. I sure wouldn't do it now knowing what I know. But I slept in a car and put newspapers against the window. Found out the worst gang in New York City at that time. In fact, they, they had over, over uh, 300 gangs listed by youth department at that time, 1958. And I went down to, to find the Mile Miles. And they were staying against the fence in their red jackets with big double M's. 28 kids had been murdered in 1958 in gang fights. And I remember going up to one young man. His name was Israel the president of the gang, and he was very kind, shook hands, and uh, said, hey, preach, you're okay. I, he had listened to me preach for about five minutes. I went to shake hands with Nicky Cruz, and he spit on me, slapped my face, and said, go to hell. I'll never forget that stinging on my face. And I, all I could burn out, I, I don't think I did it in anger, Nicky, Jesus loves you, and walked away thinking, Lord, I know you love him, but I don't know if you can save him. He's the hardest. I don't like to be slapped. I don't like to be spit on. Nicky Cruz could get that out. It was like a stuck record, broken record. All night long, Nicky, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. He hated police. He hated everybody else. Some of you have heard his testimony. Nicky, Jesus loves you. And folks, to sit in my office and look at that young man on his way to London, having reached thousands and thousands around the world, five girls... Five children, I think uh, two or three in Bible school, and all called to some kind of ministry. Nikki going on with the Lord. All I could say is, Jesus, your love finds them. Your love is everlasting. Nikki never told me, never knew what the love of Jesus was and what Christ had done for him until his little girl, his first little child, came to hear him in one of his crusades, and he was telling the story of all the terrible things he did, went home, and she wouldn't talk to him. He said, what's the matter, honey? She said, you are a bad man. I don't want to talk to you. That's not my daddy. <laughs> and it hurt him. He didn't realize till then uh, how God had changed, how the love of Jesus had manifested itself so much in his life. Sonny Arkansas, I met 28 years or, or 30 years ago down in Brooklyn under the elevated train right off the Williamsburg Bridge. And I, I went up to him in front of a pizza shop. And I, he was a drug addict just waiting for his contact. Found out his name. I said, Sonny, Jesus loves you. He said, man, get off the block. My mom's one of those hallelujah people. And she's a, one of those tongue-talking hallelujahs. You sound like one. I said, yes, I am. But I, I remember saying, Sonny, Jesus sent me down here because he loves you. Sonny had been in and out of jail, in and out of prison. His mother would see him dirty, filthy, and ragged on the street and say, Sonny, please, just come home, change your shirt, let me give you a clean meal. He said, Mama, go home. Didn't want anything to do with, with family, had no thoughts of God, been shot at, in and out of prison. But I'll never forget the day. He came remembering that invitation to come to the center, remembering that, that, just that one statement, Nikki, or rather Sonny, Jesus loves you. His love will find you. And the love of Jesus found Sonny when he came in and heard Nikki preach at our center down here in Brooklyn. And he thought that, he thought Nikki, while he was preaching, someone had gone to him, told him all about him because Nikki was preaching his life. And Sonny sunk down in his seat. Because he heard his whole story being told. And Nicky Cruz goes over to Sonny, lays hands on him and said, God, save him and call him to preach. And Sonny thought, me, preach? 
a drug addict, a killer at heart. Oh, but folks, I set my office this past week. Sonny Argonzoni is not only a pastor, he's a bishop of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. They've got churches all over America. In fact, he was in Philadelphia helping set up another one of their churches. In their, in their conferences, they have three, 4,000, all of them converted drug addicts, alcoholics, prostitutes. Sonny Argonzoni is a preacher of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the love of Christ was manifested in him. Now see, there are many of you here tonight. You know what I'm talking about because up, up here you fellas from, drug, from, from the drug life, alcoholics. Many of you, not even in Teen Child, maybe other programs. Some of you here may be in business. You were a drug addict, you were an alcoholic, you were drinking, you were lost, you were hopeless. But the love of Jesus Christ came to you. Manifested itself to you. How, how beautiful wasn't it, the love of Jesus when you first heard of it? What a flush of glory when you realized that in spite of what you'd done, Jesus loved you. And you rejoiced in that love. You went a long time just basking in that love. And then you started going around telling everybody how Jesus loved them. Some of you have been witnessing. You've been saved five years, ten years. But what's happened since then? Many of you have backslidden about the love of Jesus for yourself. Somehow along the line, you, you, you got the idea... That because you have allowed a coldness or a failure into your life, that you can preach Jesus and his love to others, but you can't appropriate it to yourself. Now this is where I'm going with the message tonight. I want to talk about his love for you as a Christian. His love for you as a believer and for me. You know, I was preaching a number of years ago in Harlem in a street meeting, and I was going through a very difficult time in our ministry. Very, very difficult. Gwen had cancer. And in fact, I think this was her second cancer she had back in the hospital. And I had the burden of teen challenge and it was weighing heavy on me. Traveling, trying to raise funds. Trying to keep the whole thing afloat. And centers, cities all over the country calling. And, and I was absolutely at the end of my rope at this particular time. I, I, and in, in my burden and in my struggle over, I, I got so burdened over needs, I went down to about 115 pounds. Skin and bone, it just, there was no joy because I was so burdened down by the needs of the city. And in that, I, I shut Gwen out. And in her pain, she, she, she couldn't stand being cut out from my life. It, it wasn't that, I don't, I don't think I was a bad husband or anything, but I didn't really bring her into the burden that was on my heart. I should have shared it with her. And we were going through a rather difficult time. And I remember one day just losing my temper and going off for a street meeting. And I felt so dirty and so unclean. Has that ever happened to you? Where, you know, you want God with all your heart. You love him with everything that's in you. And, and you fast, you pray, you seek him, but suddenly, there it is, just like a flood. It just comes and hits you and sweeps you off your feet. You lose your temper, you do something stupid, and you feel dirty and unclean and filthy. And I had to go up into Harlem, and I'm standing there in my pain, and I'm preaching my heart out. Jesus loves you. I don't care what you did. Drugs, alcohol, prostitute. Come on up, Jesus loves you. Give your heart to him. And after I preached this profound message, I thought, how Jesus could love anybody on the streets. I'm standing there after the meeting in despair watching drug addicts and alcoholics with our personal workers drinking in the love of Jesus. And suddenly, in my despair, my head down, feeling so low, the Holy Spirit said to me, David, why don't you appropriate some of that love you've been preaching for yourself? Why don't you let me love you? What gives you the idea that you can just preach it and not practice it, not appropriate it to yourself? And friends, from that day to this, there are many times I've had to just step back and say, Jesus, I've been out preaching it. I tell the whole world that you can save body, anybody from anything. Now, Jesus, come and love me. Amen. Love me. I remember one time when uh, one of Gwen's last uh, times in the hospital, she was so wiped out. She, she had uh, lupus, and had, had about 30 pounds of water on her and, and was in the hospital. 
And she, she had said, David, this is enough. I can't, after all these operations of cancer, this is just too much. And she went in the hospital just at the end of her rope. And I went to a hotel room near the hospital. And I said, oh, God, when does this ever stop? Lord, I love you. I see there's no, I can't figure it out. It, 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 she can't go through much more pain. And, you know, I said, Lord, give me something. And, you know, it's not a good idea to just say, Lord, give me something and open your Bible. Because you know where it fell? It fell in Jeremiah. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You know what you know, I did? I closed it and said, no, Lord, not today. I, I'm hurting enough. And you know what the Lord whispered in my heart? David, just lay still let me love you. So help me, the Holy Ghost brought Jesus his presence in that room, and he put his arms around me and began to love me. And I said, Jesus, now love Gwen. And, and then the Holy Spirit put a scripture, a Psalms, so and so and I went there. And you know what it said? He makes all wars to cease. I said, that's it. That's it. He's making all cease. I ran to the hospital. Gwen was dressed. He said, David, I'm healed. I'm getting out of here. Let's go home. I have victory. It was the love. The absolute love of Jesus Christ being manifested. The Bible said the husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. You can't counsel other people that they, they are loved without appropriating that love for yourself. Now, there, there are some of you here that love Jesus dearly, but you're not persuaded that Jesus Christ loves you. You preach to others. You, you, you picture yourself, though, as... as having failed the Lord, and he's cast aside as a result of it. I want to speak directly to you tonight. I, I really believe God put this on my heart, and it's why I struggled so much with all the imps of hell to get through. But here's, I was laying on my face last night, and God began to speak clearly to me, to speak directly to those who be here tonight who felt that you've let the Lord down. You feel you've let the Lord down. You've not lived up to the standard you've heard preached in this pulpit or wherever it may be. Now, friends, if you've been coming to this church, we hold up a high standard. We preach a strong message of righteousness and holiness. And many of you feel that you can't live up to that, that you failed the Lord somehow. It's not that we've been putting a heavy trip on you. We're, we're trying to preach what we believe is the standard of the Word of God. But in your striving to be more like Jesus, you've failed the Lord. You've sinned somehow. And you sit here this, after, this evening with failure in your life. You have tripped. You have fallen. Satan has bruised your heel. Now remember, that's what the scriptures, in, in, it was originally said, that the serpent will bruise your heel. And when serpent bruises your heel, does not mean you're damned or you're lost or outside of the love of Jesus. He's bruised your heel. But there's healing for that. But now you're here tonight and you're living with guilt and condemnation. You can't see how Christ can still love you because deep in your heart you know you may have grieved the Holy Spirit and you, you somehow walk right into the devil's trap or you're still in the satanic snare. But I want you to know, friends, and listen closely, you and I were reconciled to God when we were still enemies. When we were out in sin, not even thinking of God, Jesus loved us. Let me read it to you. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, yet sinners, we weren't even thinking of him. When you were out there, do you remember when you were out there? Do you remember when you had no time of, for him? Do you remember those days? And the Lord said, even then I loved you. Even then you were reconciled to me if you would have only repented and come. While you were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. The Lord saying, if I loved you when you were out there not even thinking about me, do I not love you now when you're going through a struggle? When your heart still loves me? Now, I'm not talking about those who have just put God aside. They've given themselves over to their sin. They don't want anything to do with God. They're not interested in repentance. I'm talking about Christians and others who have backslidden somehow. In fact, the closer you get to Jesus, the least thing will seem big to you in the sight 
in your own eyes. You'll feel the grief of having grieved the Lord. Now, I don't have anything profound tonight, but I want to share you just a few things that the Holy Spirit's putting in my heart about His love. First of all, God wants us to be fully persuaded, fully persuaded that nothing, absolutely nothing, can separate us from the love of Jesus Christ. I want you to go. Why don't you go to Romans 8? Why don't you go to Romans 8? The eighth chapter, verse 38. Beginning to read. Do you have it? Romans 8, 38. Oh, I love the word, don't you? For I am, this is Paul speaking, I am persuaded. I'm completely convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing shall separate us from the love of God. Now that's the truth that the devil doesn't want us to be convinced of. He doesn't want you to hear that. He doesn't want you to know it. Because here, I want you to know something. If you can come, if you can get a hold of this truth, you can come through any trial. You can come through your temptation you're going through now in your trial. You can come through any failure and be more than a conqueror if you're fully persuaded that Jesus loves you. Look, look, look at verse 5. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? For it's written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. You're conquered through the love of Jesus Christ for you. Look at me, folks. The cry of this book is be rooted and grounded in love that you may be able to endure. Yeah. You may be able to stand in a troubled time, rooted and grounded in love. Yeah. I'm afraid we're not rooted, we're not grounded in the love of Jesus Christ. Many of us, we're afraid to appropriate it. Philippians 1, 6, don't turn, says, being confident of this, that he that hath begun a good work in you will perfect it to the day of Jesus Christ. When you came to the Lord, now listen closely to me. You came to the Lord. He decided he'd not let you go. Listen to me now. You came to the Lord, and it was known in heaven and hell and earth that Jesus paid for you with his own blood. And he put a stamp on you, and he engraved you in the palm of his hand, and he said, devil, this child belongs to me. Now, no matter what problem you're going through, no matter what failure you're at, if you'll confess it and repent, you'll come back by his love. You'll be drawn back by his love. You'll be drawn back by his precious love. He that's begun a good and work in you will perfect it till the day of Christ. You're not going to let the devil interrupt his work in you. Satan's lying to some of you right now. He's trying to tell you that Jesus has given up on you. He's telling you that Jesus is mad at you. That you're just wicked and evil, you'll never amount to anything, you'll never be holy, you'll never be clean. You can hit, hear, hear Brother Bob preach, you can hear me, hear Gary, hear one of the pastors preach and say, oh, I'll never, I can't measure up. There's no way I'm going to measure up. Everybody else is measuring up, but I'm not measuring up. Have you ever sat here thinking you're the only one going through problems, only one having a problem? Anybody sitting here right now thinking you're the only one with failure in your life? You say, but what's, are you going to do it? Uh, one of those TV evangelist things on us? No, I'm not. I'm not standing here in any known failure in my life. But there are some of you sitting here now and the devil lying to you right now. He's saying, see, you tried and you can't make it. Bob did hit this so strong this morning. And here you sit wondering if you should even go on. We've had people leave this church. They have absolutely quit on the Lord because they say, I can't make it. I can't. I, I will never measure up to what he wants. I want you to know that God's given you a word. You can take it right to the devil and you can throw it right at him just as Jesus did in the wilderness and the devil's going to run. It's right there in the 8th chapter of Romans. Look at it. The 34th verse. 34th. Who is he that condemneth? Well, you know who that is, don't you? Were you condemned this afternoon before you came to church? Have you been sitting here doing the worship being condemned? We, we've got... We've got a Tom condemner who stands before the throne of God, accuser of the brethren, trying to accuse you, saying, you'll never make it. But who is this that condemneth? 
It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. You stand right up against Satan. And you can say this with everything in you. I refuse your condemnation and your lies. Jesus paid for my sins. I repent. Jesus loves me. I, I'm on his mind right now. In fact, devil, right now when you're accusing me, he has me on his mind. He has me on his lips. He's talking to the Father about me right now. He's talking to the Father about me. This very moment, he's interceding before the Father. And you can tell the devil that. Glory be to God. And then you can quote him this scripture. I write unto you that you sin not. But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. You go back to him. You say, Father, I've sinned. I've had four children and I never kicked them out because they failed me. I took them aside. Sometimes I had to take them to the woodshed. Sometimes I had to spank the meanness out of them. But all along they were my children and I loved them. And the only reason I spanked them was for their own good. When did Jesus throw you out? Tell me. When did he write a bill of a divorcement? Say, I divorce you. Go on out on your own. When did he do it? You can't tell me when he did that. He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll go with you to the end. I'm going through you with your troubles. I'm going through your trial. Hold fast. Now, notice a very interesting verse, Romans 8.35. Look at it. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Now, who is a person, isn't that? And you know who that is. That's Satan. But then look, shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword. Now, those are things. That's not a who. Those are things. Who is it that brings these things on us? Satan himself trying to bring all these things to rob us of the love of God. But I notice, look down in verse 37. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Hallelujah. Now, to separate us, who shall separate us from the love of Jesus Christ? That word separation is to isolate. In other words, to make you feel like an island of rejection. That you're not loved. And I'll tell you what the devil does. He'll first try to strip you of love of those around you. He'll try to interfere in the love of your family. Interfere in the love of your friends. And try to isolate you. In fact, the separation means to put a great gulf between it and isolate it as an island. Some of you sitting here right now knowing what that means. You have felt rejection. You felt isolated. And you, 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 feel what, you feel just what they felt in Israel. It says, but Zion has said, the Lord hath forsaken us, and my Lord hath forsaken, forgotten me. Can a woman forget her sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of her own womb? Yea, they may forget Yet I'll not forget you. Behold, I've graven you on the palm of my hand. Your walls are continually before me. And then in Hosea it says, I will heal their backslidings. I will love them freely, for mine anger is turned away from him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Friends, God wants to heal every backslider here tonight. He wants to offer you his love and to heal that backsliding of your heart. Now, the Holy Spirit has really been putting me under conviction about the danger of presenting Jesus as a hard man. Do you remember that parable? There were three servants that were given talents. One was given ten, one was given five, and one was given one talent. And the man who had the one talent went and hid it in the earth. And one day the master comes and calls him to account. And he said, I, I want what I gave you. I want my return. And you know what he said? Master, I knew thee that thou art a hard man. And I was afraid. And I went and I hid my talent. And I was on my face before God. And the Lord was saying, David, there's something you're not hearing, you're not seeing yet. And I want to tell you, I don't believe you can be a holiness preacher of any kind. You can't be a preacher of righteousness unless you're teachable. And I'm telling you now, God's telling me I've got a lot to learn. And I confess it before you here now, and I'm not trying to be sentimental or put attention on myself. But God began to say, there's so much yet I've got to learn before I can be a shepherd to, this, to the sheep here even. All of us as pastors are, are open that God would teach us. But I got to thinking, Lord was showing me, what, what kind of teacher did this man have? The other two served the Lord with joy. 
They had no problem. They made their investment. It was a glorious experience. But this man comes and he said, boy, you're hard. And he was afraid and he hid his talent. Who was his teacher? What kind of message did he sit under that made him see Jesus as hard? Because Jesus is the master here. Brother Bob had to, he, he felt the same grief that I felt one time when, when some people that sat under his teaching had, had gone to a pastor and tried to correct him as if, you know, they knew it all now because they'd come into a holiness message. And Bob was alarmed and he got on the phone. He says, tell me, did my preaching produce that in you? And there was terror in Bob and in my own heart. Are, are, are we going to preach a message that would produce that kind of thing? Are they misjudging what is being said? And I got to thinking, Lord, what kind of a, a pastor, what kind of a teacher, what kind of a message was he sitting under that he perceives Jesus as a hard man? A Friday night, a young pastor met me back. I don't know if he's here tonight or not. And tears in his eyes, visiting from another state. And he said, Brother Dave, I've been preaching holiness in my church, and I preach it hard. And he said, the people are not receiving it, and they're leaving left and right. But I can't compromise on my message. And I felt pain in my heart, because all over the country now, there, there, there's a message of holiness coming forth. There's a message of righteousness. But folks, too many are preaching it as hardness. They're not presenting Jesus in fullness. I remember something Bob told me that changed my life. He said, David, when we preach holiness, we must never veil Christ. We must never veil the mercy of Jesus Christ. But you see, I, I don't want to be that hard man or, or, or that man that preaches a message that pictures Jesus only as a hard man because that produces fear and fear has torment and then people go and hide. Because they feel they can't make it. I don't want to be one of those preachers. You know, there are times when I, well, when I have to preach a strong message, a prophetic message especially. I know that there are some people that are out there that they're just, they, they want to say, yeah, preach it, Brother Dave. Get it. Hit it. Hit it. Hit it. It's almost like a cheering section. Hit it. And sometimes, Pastor, I know there have been times I've been carried up in it. I confessed to Bob today about a time down in Georgia. I was preaching at a camp meeting two years ago. And I, on that campground, I saw these great big satellite dishes. And you know my hatred for television. The superintendent of the movement there was great big, biggest dish I ever saw. And I'll tell you what, I got up there in that pulpit and boy, I skinned them alive. By the way, the Lord doesn't want hides. He wants souls, you know, skinning i tell you what, I thundered and I, uh, ever since I felt the pain for what I did. And later some pastors said, boy, you were hard, Brother Dave. But you know, there were some people in there just fed something in them. They wanted to hit it. They wanted hard, hard, hard. Now I'm going to tell you now, I'm not going to compromise on my message. I'm going to preach it. But there have been evangelists, you know, that have preached a hard message and you were there watching either on television or something. Yeah, there. give it to them. That's right. And he's, they'll say, I'll not compromise. I'm going to preach and tell it like it is. But I've been hearing the Holy Spirit say to me, David, how are you presenting me to the sheep? Are you showing them my mercy and my love and my long suffering along with my hatred for sin? Are you making them afraid, so afraid that they'll hide? And I want the Lord to help me preach holiness stronger than I've ever preached it, but I want to preach it with brokenness. I want to be like Paul who said, I came to you like in the tenderness of a nurse. I'm going to read it to you. Paul said, but we were gentle among you. Even as a nurse cherisheth her children, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted to you not the gospel of God only, but our also our very souls, because you were dear to us. I confess to you, I've never known that. I'm beginning to know it. I've never passed. I've been an evangelist. And I've thundered all over the world. I don't think I know what it's like to be a nurse, to look out over a congregation of people living in a wicked city, hurting, carrying all kinds of burdens and garbage from your past. And I, wanted, I want to see you walk in holiness. And all the past, we want to see you walk in holiness so much. 
Now, I, I can't speak for Bob. I know these men. Bob has a tender heart. Gary has a tender heart. I need this. I need to have that gentleness as a nurse, cherish of their children, not trying to spank them because there's a sickness, there's a disease, there's sin. And Paul is saying, I came to you people. My dear sheep is a nurse, cherishes her children. So being affectionate, desirous of you, we're willing to impart to you not just the gospel only, but our very souls because you're dear to us. Paul then added, we exhorted and we comforted and charged every one of you as a father to charge his children. No wonder Paul's message of holiness was received. It wasn't rejected. People didn't walk out here. Because he said, when you received this word of God, which you heard of us, you received it. Not as word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. I told this young preacher what I want to tell every preacher of righteousness and holiness in America. If you're going to be preaching a strong message, preach it through brokenness. Preach it through tears. And folks, that's what I've asked God to do for this pulpit. You may have heard people say, Times Square Church, you go down there and you just get beat. No, you don't get beat here. You won't get beaten here because God's breaking this ministry. He's breaking the hearts of the pastors, telling us that we need to be like Paul. We need to share with you as precious children, not trying to whip you, not trying to drive you, but to go to the throne of God Touch his righteousness. Touch his holiness. See a vision of Jesus so clear. And then come to you and say, here he is. In all of his love, he hates sin. And that's why we preach so strong about it. We feel his wrath against it. And we don't want you to be damned. We love you too much. But to do it as a nurse. To do it as a father with looking with love to his children. And I confess before a holy God I've not had that. I've not had that. But I want it. Make Jesus, present Jesus in his fullness. Sometimes we're like the man who was forgiven a great debt. And then we walk right out and choke somebody who's not living up to our standard. The Bible says of Jesus, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful as your father's also merciful. That's Luke 6.35. Jesus is kind to the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful as your father's also merciful. James said, the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercies. Now God's showing me. He's just pounding in me with love. He, he'd been speaking all week to me, so strong. How serious this matter is, is how, of how we present Jesus to the world. How we present him. Paul said, we are ambassadors for Christ. You know what that means? We represent him. The only thing the world's going to see of Jesus is what we show it. What we show the world of him. There, there's a, down in Brazil, I think it's in Brasilia, there's a cathedral, and there's a, a, one of those uh, glass windows, colored glass, leaded glass windows, and it's, it's, it's Jesus. You see all these people kneeling before him, and Jesus is standing with a great big club in his hand, ready to smite them. And that's their vision of Jesus. That's a perverted view of Jesus. And, and, and those people come there with that great fear of this man in heaven with a club over their head. God's word says he is very pitiful and of tender mercies. And he's saying if you're going to witness out in the street or you're going to counsel anybody, if you're going to talk to people about Jesus, you've got to be a faithful ambassador. You've got to represent me for my, who, who I really am. And what, what the word says, be, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful. Be courteous. Be pitiful, be courteous. First Peter 3 8. Do you know, much of the street preaching here in New York City is very discourteous. Very discourteous. It's confrontational. 
It's mean. Sometimes it's ugly. I, I, I would imagine we've got 10, 15 street preachers here tonight. But if you're a street preacher, or if you're a witness, or you are a counselor, you've got to understand what the Holy Spirit's saying tonight. Be careful. This is an awesome responsibility. How you present Jesus. Are you presenting him in his fullness? Or are you just showing one side of him? You know, uh, Steve and I were walking down 42nd Street a few weeks ago. And Steve was carrying a briefcase. And this street preacher, God bless his heart, up in the 42nd Street here in Broadway. He stopped. We, we, we just, I just stopped to listen. And he said, look at this. Two, me and Steve... Two computer junkies. They got their computer with them. They're so hooked on computers. You know what's in that box? A microphone. This microphone I have right here. With a big box that we carried in. Computer junkies. They're so wrapped up in the world. I mean, he scolded us. To hear that, dear brother, we were headed right down to hell. <laughs> Sliding right down on our computer. We, we were tempted to open the box. What, what, what are you telling them out there? You're shaking an accusing finger in their face. And this Lord who is very pitiful of tender mercies, are you making him out to be a monster? Are you? I don't want to misrepresent Jesus anymore. Be ye also pitiful. Be courteous. Now, look, the Bible said those who sin must be rebuked before all. That's 1 Timothy 5.20. The Bible said we are to exhort and rebuke with all authority, Titus 2.15. Unruly mouths must be stopped. You've got to rebuke them sharply, Titus 1.13. But we're also commanded to rebuke with all long-suffering. Now, that word long-suffering means very lenient, patient, and understanding. You know what the Scripture said? Street preachers, listen. Witnesses, listen. Counselors, listen. Preach the Word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort, which means counsel, with all long-suffering. You're to do it, but you're to do it with pity, compassion, and long-suffering. Paul preached with that long-suffering. He said, I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long-suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Do you know that you're a pattern of his long-suffering? Come on now, tell me it wasn't his long suffering that found you. How patient has he been with you? That, that's what God told me about television too. You know, last time I talked about television here, I did it with the tears in my eyes. I did it with a broken heart. And if I ever tell you again, God hates it, I'm going to tell it to you because I love you and I'm not trying to rail against you. But I, I've got to tell you right now, if it weren't for the long suffering of Jesus, I wouldn't be standing in this pulpit now. Folks, somewhere along the line, uh, I, I would have turned my back somehow, not on the Lord, but something would have crept in. My family would have been disintegrated and everything else, but for the long suffering. I stand here like Paul is a pattern of the patience and the long suffering of Jesus Christ. How long he bore with some of my foolishness. How long he put up with me. And yet he brought me back to this place and I stand now in his holy freedom. How patient he's been with you. Why will you not be patient with others then? Why will you not be patient with those that you deal with all around you? Now, truthfully, the love of Jesus never gives up on people. I want to show it to you, Revelation 3.15. Revelation 3.15. I'm not going to preach much longer. Revelation 3.15. You, you know this, he's talking about the Laodicean church. Don't you know that's the backslidden church? That's the harlot church? Look at verse... Revelation 3.15, the Lord is saying, And I know thy works, speaking the Laodicean church, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would you were either cold or hot. So then because you're lukewarm and not cold or hot, I'll spew you out of my mouth, because thou sayest I'm rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. You don't know that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I'd look this way for just a minute, if you will, please. You, you see... Jesus standing at the door. Well, if I, would you just look at verse 20. He's already told me he's going to spew them out of his mouth, hasn't he? 
Now look what he said. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Listen very closely to me now. It'd be easy. And I, I think there was a time in my ministry I could have stood in a pulpit and I, I, I would have said something like this. Look, there it is in black and white. I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. Folks, is it in your Bible? There it is. In black and white, I'll spew you out of my mouth. You're compromised, you're backslided, you're naked, you're cold, you're lost, you're undone. And God said, I'll spew you out of my mouth. And I had been preaching the truth halfway. Because look at verse 18. There's Jesus. He doesn't want them to be spewed out of his mouth. Look, he's counseled them. He said, please buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich. He doesn't want them to be poor in spirit. And white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. He's trying to cover their shame. He's not trying to expose anything. He's trying to cover it by his blood. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. And for as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. He's offering mercy. He's offering grace. And see, if I had just come and preached, I'll spill you out of my mouth, I would have had scripture to prove it. But I would not have preached Jesus in his fullness. I would have missed. Behold, I stand at the door of your heart and knock. Before I'll spill you out of my mouth, I'm going to knock on your door. Because I really don't want to spill my mouth. I want to sit down and eat with you. I don't want you standing naked before the world. I want you covered. But see, we give up on our weak brethren. If we're working with people and they fail us, especially after the second or the third time, it usually, I know it's, I've said it so many times. Look, I've tried. I can't waste any more time. He doesn't want God. He knows where I'm at if he wants the Lord. I'll be here, but I'm not going out of my way. I don't think you're going to make it anyhow. Have you said that about your husband or your wife? I don't know what it's going to take. I've prayed and I'm tired of praying. Man, I've done everything I know how to do. There's nothing left. And I mean, most people, do. we just give up on people. I'm so glad Jesus doesn't. I'm so glad Jesus didn't give up on Peter. Peter didn't deny him once. He didn't deny him twice. He, didn't, he denied him three times. He cursed him. He said, I don't even know the man. I don't know him. He told me Satan was after me to try to sift me. He warned me. I heard the word, I was warned, and yet even in spite of the word that I heard, I've been sitting under this kind of ministry, and I went right out and I did something to grieve my Lord. How could I have done it? Does that sound familiar? Come on. Amen. Don't hide. The Holy Spirit knows where you're at. Oh, but Peter, Peter remembers something Jesus said. And I can, Peter says, oh, the look in his eyes, I'll never forget that look. What was that look? It was a look of love. Because Jesus said, Peter, <laughs> i got to read it to you. Peter, I've prayed for you that your faith fail not. And when you're converted, strengthen your brethren. You know what, Peter? You know what brought him back? I'm convinced of it. Peter's weeping over the hilltops. He's walking up and down the hillside of Judea and said, I've denied him. I've sinned. <laughs> I've grieved the Lord. I shouldn't have done it. I'm his servant. I've preached his gospel. I've laid hands on the sick. I let him down. Oh, but he said something to me. He said he's going to pray for me. He's praying for me. He's praying for me right now. He's praying for me. Do you know that he's doing that right now for you? And for me, he's before the Father. He's praying for us just like he prayed for Peter. And then Peter remembers something else. Jesus said... I'm going to be converted. I'm coming back. And when I come back, I'm going to be an example to my brothers. Strengthen your brothers. I'm going to be an example of his grace. Can't you say that right now to yourself and to the devil and the whole world? Yes, I've grieved him. I've sinned, but I hate it. I despise it. And I know he's interceding for me right now. And he's saying, you come back to me, and when you're converted, I'm going to make you stronger, and I'm going to use you. You're going to be a testimony to me and to your brothers. Hallelujah. 
What kind of love is that? I'm going to close in just a minute. You remember, you remember the prodigal son who just took his belongings and went off and he wound up in a pig pen eating the husk of the pigs? You ever been there? Far, some of you are there. I, I have to close now, but this is where the Holy Spirit has brought me for tonight. Please hear me, and I don't, I'm not going to do it psychologically or sentimentally or anything else, but I ask the love of Jesus to make it real. Do you know that whole time that prodigal son was out there feeding the pigs? What was his father? His father was looking for him, waiting for him. See, the Lord won't force himself on you, but he's waiting. All you have to do is like the prodigal son, come to the end of yourself, say, look, I've had it. I can't carry this guilt, this condemnation. And more than that, my father has everything that I need. Do you know that father was praying for that son? According to the scripture, if you put everything else together, you, you see the picture, the composite picture. And one day he gets up and he comes back. And that's what God wants you to do tonight. You in the balcony here, down on the main floor, you have that burden on you. You've slipped away from the Lord. Your heart's grown cold. You're under condemnation and guilt. Lord said neither. Do. He, he told the woman, I don't condemn you. Go sin no more. Where are your accusers? He's not your accuser tonight. He's your savior. He's your savior. So this, this boy gets up and he heads back home. And before he even gets there, his father sees him and runs after him. You know, the, that's Jesus. That he comes after you, take one step to him, and I mean he'll come to you. The father didn't go up to him and says, you spent every, look at it, I told you it happened. I knew you'd do it. There was a streak in you, it's been there all the time. You're a brother, you're older brother, you ought to be like him. Stayed right here faithful. Well, that's not what he told him. What'd he do? He fell on his neck and kissed him. He saw his dirty clothes and he said to his servants, take those clothes, put new clothes on his back. Lord said, I'm going to make you a righteous person. I'm going to clean you up. The Lord's master said, take off those filthy shoes. He put new shoes on him. And the, the, the boy said, but I'm not worthy. Master, Father, I failed you. I've sinned against you. I've sinned against God. I'm not worthy. In other words, Lord, let me stay out here till I work my way in. I've got to earn your respect now. No, the father said, right into the house. And he had a feast with him. Put on a feast. Why? Because the prodigal son could say, I've sinned against God, I've sinned against you, and I'm not worthy. And when you come to that place, then you come to the feast. He doesn't want you just camping outside. He wants you at his table tonight. Kill the fatted calf. and says, come on home. My son who is dead is alive again. Hallelujah. Some of you have been dead. God's going to resurrect you tonight. Hallelujah. Well, I told you, it's very simple. Per, bow your heads. Oh, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Show us your love tonight. How you're reaching out in love tonight to say, if you'll get up out of your despair, if you just get up out of your flesh, get up out of this thing that has a hold of you and come to me I'll receive you I'll make you righteous all you have to do is get up and come come home come home come home Lord Jesus I feel your love tonight for this people truly you love us you love us with an undying love Holy Spirit, just come and put your arms around the sinner here tonight. Put your arms around the backslider. Put your arms around those that are struggling with the weight, saying, I can't take it anymore. I, I'm bound by this thing and I want to be free and I don't know how to get free. Lord, put your arms around them and by your Spirit, just draw them. And tonight, break every chain that binds them and set them free. My message tonight, God's intention for this midnight hour, God's intention. Oh, King Jesus, we love you. Be exalted, O oh Lord. Oh, we adore your name. 
Jesus, touch us with fire. Touch us with yourself. We've sung, be glorified. Now, Lord, do it. God, burn the word into our hearts. My King, Lord Jesus, be exalted tonight. We love you. Amen. God's intention for this midnight hour. Do you remember the, the hippies and the flower children? An entire generation of searching, restless, hungry young people. Do you remember when they massed in Woodstock and in huge rock concerts all over the America? And the pervading questions of the time were, who am I? Why am I here? What's the purpose at all? And when no one could answer them intelligently, many of them dropped out. But you see, they were asking questions that God's children should have been asking themselves. These were questions the Holy Spirit was trying to bring to us. But we were so busy, so occupied with ourselves and with health and wealth, we didn't even hear what the Spirit's saying, so he had to take the question to the hippies and the dropouts because we weren't even in tune. I believe the Holy Spirit of God's been trying desperately for 20 years to get a message into the church. They heard because they were hungry. But now it's time for the church of Jesus Christ to listen to the Holy Spirit. And he that hath ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the church. Here are the questions the Spirit has to get through to you and me tonight. Why are you here? What is God's intention for you in this crisis hour? Do you really know what God expects of you in these last times? What is God's one great final purpose for our lives? What is His purpose? And how sad today that so few men and women of God can answer that question. There's only a remnant left today who understand God's purpose for his children in the last days. A majority of ministers today are sounding a trumpet that's making uncertain sounds. And the uncertainty in the pulpit has spread a cloud of uncertainty in the congregation. And multitudes of Christians who profess to be serving a mighty God still live in bondage and despair. There's absolute ruin in some churches today. Everywhere you look, there is ruin, and you know it. There's an emphasis on certain doctrinal issues by evangelists and teachers, and it only adds to confusion. And many hungry people today are asking, who is right? Just what is God's purpose for today? What is the Lord's intention for me and for his church? Is it miracles? Is it casting out demons, discipleship, church growth? We hear so much that is confusing. What is God's intention? What's his real purpose for the last hour? And I believe that God has had but one great intention for his people ever since the cross. It will not change. It has not changed. There has been but one purpose from the beginning. There will be but one purpose till Christ returns. God's intention has to do with understanding the mystery of the gospel that was first revealed to the Apostle Paul. And it's a mystery no longer according to the Apostle. Paul said, by revelation, God made known to me the mystery which in other ages were not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed by the Spirit. And he has come to make known to all men what is the fellowship of the mystery. Now the mystery revealed, and this is what you've got to understand, we've got to understand it before we go any further. The mystery that has been revealed through Paul and to the church of all ages. Christ's body is still here on earth. Christ's body is still here on earth. The head is in heaven, which is Christ, but the rest of his body is right here on earth. We who love Jesus and serve him represent his visible parts, that which men can see of Christ on earth. For we are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones, and he is the head of the body of the church. Now God's full intention for this last hour can be summed up in one sentence. Listen to it. Since we are Christ's body on earth, God's intention is that every member become a true expression of who Jesus is. That you, that I, that everyone that calls themselves by his name, become a true, holy expression of who Christ is on this earth. Now God intends that we express a complete, full Christ, so that any sinner on the face of the earth can look at you and can look at me, 
and seek Christ as surely as he were walking on the flesh on this earth, in the flesh. The world, the sinner has to be able to look at you and see the same fullness, the same intention of pleasing God as they saw in Christ as he walked in the flesh. Because we are his flesh and his bone. We are the visible body of Christ on earth. The mystery unfolded is that Christ's body is still visible here on earth. And it's you and it's me. We are to appropriate so much of him, of his glory, his completeness. The world will see us, see in us the hope, the answers to all their needs. And if you and I cannot live out Christ, we have no right to preach him. If we are not a true expression of who he is, we have no right to talk of him. It's not enough either to just know Christ. We've got to be a full expression of who he is. You have got to look at everything in your life. I've got to look at everything in my life. In this light, does this represent, this what I'm doing, this what I am, does this represent who Christ is? Is this what I want the sinner to see and know of him? Would Christ in his physical body walk into an X-rated theater? Would he linger around a pornography counter? Would Christ abuse his body in any way? Would he indulge in adultery and fornication or drinking? Would he cheat? Would he tell dirty, dirty stories? Would he lie? Would he live a lie and then attempt to preach the truth? Would he try to spread the light when there was a pocket of darkness in his own life? Would he tell others not to commit adultery and then in secret do it himself? You see, we've got to keep before our eyes this one great intention of God that his body would always reflect who Christ is. Now, if you set your heart tonight on becoming a true expression to the world of who Jesus is, you're going to stir the very wrath of hell. You can build all the colleges you want. You can raise up orphanages and retreats and build churches all to God's glory, quote, unquote. You can go out and evangelize and you can give your body to be burned at the stake because you see, the devil will not trouble a miracle worker or a moralist, but Satan will not leave you alone once you set your heart on truly expressing the holiness and the righteousness of Jesus Christ to the world and showing the world by your life who he is. You see, when you discover God's intention and you begin to know who you are, his body. And when you cut into the center of that purpose, when you know you're called to be as he was on the earth, you're going to be the direct target of everything in hell. Would you build an orphanage over in Africa? Would you go to the Amazon to preach the gospel? Would you go to the American slums and give your body to human need? Would you go to college campuses in Iran and preach for Christ and sell out to God? That's very commendable. That's fine. But it's not God's first intention for you in this last day. Because if you are not a true expression of who Jesus is, everything you do is human. It's works and it'll burn at the judgment. Because the scripture said in the last days, many will come saying, Lord, Lord, did we not cast out devils? Did we not heal the sick? Did we not do many things in your name? And he'll say, depart from me, you work when you can. I never knew you. And conversely, you never knew me. And when Peter stood before Christ and said, I don't know the man, he wasn't lying. He spent three years with him and never knew him. Who is the one who has vision? We talk about a man, a woman having vision, a man of God who has vision. Is that the one who builds a great church, who has the big budget, who speaks to the largest TV crowds? No, the one with vision is the one who reflects the glory of Christ, who's had a vision, eternal vision of who he is in Christ, sitting in heavenly places, and who is able to reflect the glory of Jesus. Because God will not sponsor anything that does not reflect Christ. Whatever is born out of relationship to Jesus is the only thing, the only thing that he sponsors is that which comes out of the mind of Christ. 
And I don't see much in America today that is a true expression of who Jesus is. There's so much of ego, bragging, competition, struggle for recognition, but so little of Jesus Christ. I switch on the television set and I watch the Christian gospel programming and my heart grows sick. The pitiful appeals for money, the spectacular expensive sets, the endless small talk. And I cry and I say, oh God, is this the best expression to the world we can give of who Jesus is? Raising money for a choo-choo train. The time is not far off when things are going to start unraveling and coming apart. The daily news will become terribly frightening. The economy will yet go into complete disarray. You watch the end of this year and see what happens. The nations of this world are going to tremble with fear. We're about to enter the most ominous times in history. And everything the scripture says it can be shaken is going to be shaken. And what's going to count then? When everything around you is crumbling, you're going to see men of God stand in the midst of their projects and weep and howl. Massive building programs are going to sit idle. Cobwebs and bats will fill the temples. And the monuments of self-achievement are going to haunt the people who built them. Those who chased after health and wealth and prosperity are going to be empty and desolate because they have no inner strength to face the horrors that are falling. They have no history with God. Those who took the things of God so lightly who never broke away from the world in its spirit, those who are unwilling to forsake the old world in their own ways, they're going to have nothing to see them through the final days. There's only going to be one thing that matters then. Do I know Jesus Christ intimately? Am I an expression of Him on this, in this dark hour? Will I be one of the few who will witness to this crazy world that Christ is above it all? Will I be His shining light when it gets dark and cold? Now, if there's something in your heart that responds to this call to be an expression of Him, And you're yearning to be that expression. There are two things that you've got to understand tonight. One part is Christ and one part is yours and mine. I want to discuss them with you. First of all, this is his part. We cannot be an expression of Christ until we're convinced that everything is clear between God and us. You've got to once and for all understand what Christ did at the cross. And this generation lacks the theology of the cross of Jesus Christ and its victory. The entire charismatic movement. The upper room has overshadowed the cross. We've developed a Christless Pentecost. Without a theology of the cross and its victory. We don't even know that God's heart was satisfied by what Jesus did, by what he did. Because at the cross, Jesus Christ forever took away the thing that offended God's eye about me. He once and for all satisfied the heart of God. And if God is satisfied with me, I'm going to be satisfied. He took away that which was in the eye of God, giving us a right from that day on to be in His presence and to be accepted before God. There is not a single thing that stands between the child of God and the Father. Not one thing now that stands between. You don't dare go another step tonight until you fully understand the efficacy of the cross of Jesus Christ's blood. That you and I are fully pardoned. God does not have to be appeased. He's been fully appeased if that's the word you want to use. He's been fully satisfied. The cross, get it? The cross is cleared us before the eyes of God. We are clear. You may forget that, but God doesn't. The veil was torn that allowed us entrance. It was God saying, you are now accepted. Come boldly to my throne. You are now mine in the beloved. You are accepted in the beloved. You and I can't even pay for our sins because we don't even know The extent of the offense. We didn't know what the offense was. We don't even know how we grieve God. How can you pay for an offense you don't even know the extent of? Jesus Christ knew the extent of the distance between us and the cross and God. And he closed the distance. He brought us to the heart of God. And you don't know anything about the heart of God until you look at the prodigal son. 
And you see it not as a story of a sinner coming back, but it's the story of the joy of the heart of God, of those who come to Him. Before He even comes, He's there rejoicing. He brings Him into the house and puts a ring on His finger and a robe on His back, and He accepts Him and He has a feast. That story is the rejoicing of the heart of God. It's a reflection of what is in the heart of God. The love for His children. The love for those that are under the blood of Jesus Christ. We have lacked the knowledge of the security that we have under the blood. This is one issue that's got to be settled once and for all. You cannot allow a cloud between you and the Father. But you say, David, my heart condemns me. I still sin. I've done things I believe have grieved the Holy Spirit. I'm unworthy. There are times the heavens seem brass. But the Bible said, if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart. All you have to do is repudiate your sin to hate it, confess it. You've got to believe that in Him forgiveness of sins is preached. Do you preach that and then not believe it for yourself? That in Him forgiveness of sins is preached. Hallelujah. And here's where most Christians fail, especially young people. They live with unnecessary fear and bondage because they don't understand the glory and the victory of the cross. They are clear in God's eyes, but they don't know it. God is completely satisfied, totally satisfied by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And the way has been cleared into God's presence. There's nothing blocking access now except our fears and our lack of knowledge. And won't it be a shame that so many of us stand before God and we had so much that was offered and we didn't enter in because of our lack of knowledge. We couldn't believe it was so glorious. It was so beautiful that God said, I will not impute your sins against you. They're forgiven. They're under the blood. And it was too good to believe. And we lived under constant fear and condemnation. Getting saved and resaved and filled and refilled. And never understanding the glory of the cross that God has been satisfied. Hallelujah. When the veil was rent in two, it was not just that God allowed us to come in, but God could go out. He goes out immediately to a sinner called Saul. The veil was rent not to just let us in, but to let the love of God flow. And he goes to Saul immediately and says, Saul, Saul, come home. Hallelujah. How incredible. We offend God. We create this distance between us and Him. And yet He is so anxious to clear us in His own eyes. He sends His own Son, provides His own sacrifice to clear the way back. He judges sin. The offense is removed. And now God says, their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. You can't face the world until you're in that glory. Until you have that peace and the glory of sins forgiven that God is not trying to impute sins to you now. He's trying to reconcile you to Himself. He didn't have to be reconciled. He was never not reconciled to the world. He has always been reconciled to the world, but now He was out to have us reconciled to Him. He Himself removed the distance. Hallelujah. What is there in us that attracted the grace of Jesus Christ? Was there some marvelous grace in us? Was there some beauty or goodness or strength? Was there some kind of potential in us that attracted the grace of God through Christ? No. It's misery that attracts grace. It's need that attracts grace. You find that all through the New Testament, that our greatest attraction to God is that we are poor, helpless creatures in need. What attracted Jesus to the Syrophoenician woman? What attracted Him to the blind and to the infirm and the widows and the fatherless? What they all had in common was helplessness. What is it that attracts the grace of God in me and in you tonight? It's our helpless condition exemplified by the palsied man. And they came unto Jesus, bringing one sick of the palsy. And take a good look at that man, because he represents the helplessness. 
of this generation, the helplessness of you and me, having not one iota of strength or power. This palsied man can't even bring himself to Christ. You look at him trembling and weak and helpless. He's a prisoner to his bed. That's you and me before we understand this concept of deliverance through the cross. Jesus stands before this helpless man that's let down through the roof to him. And he didn't even mention his physical condition. First, the Lord was going to clear him before God's eyes. He would clear him before he heals him. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. You have to be accepted before you're delivered. Accepted before you're healed. And you have to know that you're accepted before you step out. Know what a beautiful picture of the love of God in Jesus Christ. He's a helpless man. He's too overwhelmed by his infirmity to even whimper. He can't even muster a confession. He has nothing to offer Christ. He's too weak. You see, the scripture said, It's not of works, lest any man should boast, but we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. It's not something that you and I have done. It's something that he is doing. Hallelujah. We are his workmanship. The Pharisees, with all their good works and their boasting, never did attract the grace of God. It was J.B. Stoney who said, the more parade, the less depth. The more parade. Look at the ministries in America today and judge it that way. The more show, the more parade, the less depth. But see how the weakness of man attracts his sympathy and his grace. You show me a person, you show me a child of God struggling with some hated besetting sin. Someone who's crushed beneath a load of guilt and despair. Hating the sin but feeling helpless and weak. Now I'll show you one who is the object of the abundant grace of Jesus Christ. Because where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Are you struggling? Oh, you're an object of His grace. It's our helplessness, our need that attracts grace. Hallelujah. Satan will come against you in this struggle. He'll suggest to you that God is mad at you. That you have no right into God's presence. He'll throw Old Testament concepts at you that have no right to be even thought of under the blood. He'll say that wrath and judgment's at the door. And I want you to know those are lies. All lies. All you have to do is look up to the Lamb of God and in your utter helplessness you hear these comforting words, Son, daughter, thy sins be forgiven thee. Hallelujah. Then you stand by faith on the finished work of the cross from that moment on. Let me show you something now. Through faith in Jesus Christ, your sins are under the blood. You live on the other side of the veil. You're seated with Christ in heavenly places. You're accepted in the Beloved. You are one with Christ and the Father. God's wrath against your sin has been satisfied. You have been given an inheritance. You are now more than a conqueror. You are now living and moving in the Spirit. There's a bloodline between you and Satan. Your accuser has been cast down and put to open shame. You are filled with the fullness of Christ. You have a power in you to meet everything having to do with life and godliness. You are the apple of his eye in the hollow of his hands. Purged from your iniquity. Renewed in your mind. You are reconciled, justified, sanctified, made ready as a bride. Translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. You are made an heir of all things in Christ Jesus. You are no longer under condemnation. Because there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Christ abides in you. He reveals himself to you. And no height, no depth, no principality, no power, not man, not angels, not things on earth, not things in heaven can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. You are feeding on Christ the manna from heaven. You're living in Zion in God's presence. He is your friend. He's your priest. He's your advocate. He's your Lord. He's your guide. What more do you want? And do you believe those things are true? Do you believe he said it? Do you believe that God made these promises to weak and helpless creatures such as we? Do you believe this treasure is in earthen vessels? Are you forgiven? Are you clear in the sight of God? Have you accepted your acceptance? 
Do you believe while you're sitting here right now that you're fully accepted in the sight of God and nothing stands between you and Him and that you have an open heaven and you can pray for a spirit of revelation and knowledge in the things of Christ? Yes. And you can become a true expression of who Jesus is only as you take your place at the right hand of the Father, truly accepted, all the hindrances removed, not by you, not by anything you can do, not by promises you make, not by what you feel, but what Christ has done. There's a four-letter word the church has never understood. It's called done, D-O-N-E. Do you know that you can love Jesus and still be miserable because you don't know you're accepted? The most miserable people I meet in America are those who truly love the Lord with all their heart, but they've never entered into their acceptance before Christ. They've never entered into the glory of the cross of Jesus Christ. I don't want to be just forgiven. I want to be free. Hallelujah. Secondly, and this is your part and mine. He's done his part. It's done. It's finished. We are accepted in his sight. And oh, that's the blessedness that David was talking about of the man who knows that God is no longer imputing sins against him. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Here's your part. To become a true expression of Christ, you must take up your bed and walk. That's our part. The palsied man was forgiven and cleared in God's eye, but he was still a prisoner. He was relieved of all of his sins, but he was still impotent. He knew Christ as relief, but he didn't know him as resource. Now, come on now. This is where the majority of the church of Jesus Christ is, and this is where the entire charismatic movement seems to be right now. They know Christ as relief. My sins are forgiven. They're under the blood but they've never known his resource. They've never been able to take up the bed and walk. It's not enough to be a forgiven cripple or a relieved prisoner. It's something you've got to do. Jesus said, Is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk? But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. I say unto thee, the sick of the palsy, arise and take up thy bed and go thy way into thine house. In other words, they go home and practice it in your home first. Go to your house. That man gets up out of that bed, but he did not get up out of that bed in his own strength. Christ imparted a supernatural strength to him because without Christ we can do nothing. We know it is the power of the Holy Spirit and Christ was actually saying to this man, and he says it to you and me, I'm going to make you an example of my power over sin. You're going to become strongest where you were weakest. The thing that made you a prisoner you will pick up and carry. You will overcome the very thing that held you down. You'll become strongest at your weakest point. A spiritual cripple who has a controversy at the center who still has a cloud between him and God, who still lives with secret sin, cannot be a full expression of who Christ is. Now, every one of us in this room tonight knows what our weakness is. You know what the weakness is by the way God deals with you and by what convicts you. We know where we're most vulnerable. And Satan will come to you and suggest that one day that weakness will overcome you and cast you down and you'll lose everything. But that's not so. By His glorious power, God can make us strongest at our weakest point. That's what the Scripture means by His strength being made perfect in our weakness. The man that was told to steal no more was made strong in that weakest point because God said, I'm not going to make him not steal anymore. I'm going to give him a job so that he can become a giver. I'm going to take, a, I'm going to take this taker. I'm going to make him a giver. He's going to become strongest at his weakest point. He once stole, and now he's going to work, and he's going to give. God will take you at your weakest point to show his glory to the whole world. He'll make you strongest at that point, and that should be your desire and your faith in God's power to accomplish that in your life. You say, I want to be expression of Christ, but there's something hindering you now. 
And you know it. The Spirit's convicted you of besetting sin of weakness and intercontroversy that's still unresolved. But that hindrance you know must go. The prison doors have been opened. You've been forgiven, but you can't stay in that bed. You can't go about as a cripple. You've been in that bed long enough. You've been palsied by sin long enough. What in the world will the Lord do to get us out of that dominion of sin? How does He get us out of bed? He said He will give us a power to overcome. And we talk about this power as being something mysterious, but it's really not. Now listen closely, please. Let me try to explain as I see it. You and I are engrafted as a vine into Christ. Isn't that correct? We're as a branch into this vine who is Jesus Christ. All right, the very same power that enabled him to fulfill the will of God on earth is the very same power that enables us. The very same spirit that quickened him and raised him is not another spirit that comes on us. It's the self-same spirit. Couldn't you imagine the Holy Spirit going into that tomb and shaking, trembling that body and bringing life? That's the same, same spirit that raises and quickens us. The same place that Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father is where you and I are seated. Scripture says, no man has seen God and lived. And Isaiah said, when King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. But that's the night Isaiah died. The message is, see God and die. And when you really see Him, you'll die to this world. You become detached. And the more attached you become to Jesus Christ, the less de attached you are to this world. You become detached to material things when you become totally attached to the throne. How do we get, how do we know our sins are forgiven? You stand here tonight and you say, we believe the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses them all. How do you know that? It's by faith. You take that by faith. And when you take it by faith, there's a witness and you go your way with peace of mind. How do you know you have power? It is not by some outward expression. This is by faith and faith alone. You've got to believe that what God said is true, that when the Spirit of God came on you, he gave you power over all the forces of hell. Here's one preacher who will never ever accept the fact that a Christian can be possessed of a demon. How in the world can you live beyond the veil and a demon cross the veil? How can you be in the hall of his hand and a demon sit in the hall of his hand? How can you be seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus and have a devil sitting behind you? Or behind you? How can the devil cross a bloodline? No, 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 no in a thousand years, no, no. No, no, no. Don't ever let that come to you. Oh, I reject that in the name of the Lord. There is no scripture for that in the Bible. There's no scripture. I have the anointing on this. The blood of Jesus Christ. Satan cometh, Jesus said, has nothing in me. Unless you can say that, look the world in the eye. Never be afraid of the devil again in your life. And you're not to be focused on your sins anymore. You're to be focused on the right hand of the Father. Where you're seated in Jesus Christ. Not focused on sins, but the cross and the victory won there. Hallelujah. This palsied man gets up and walks and carries his bed. And that's a type of the believer who's in mastery over his sin. And what a, an expression of Christ this man was. What hope he gave to all the sick and the affirm and those who were burdened by sin. Didn't he give hope to everybody that saw that palsied man work here in his bed, walk? Isn't that what God's after today? He's not seeking for anything else but overcomers. Now listen. I'm convinced that the Lord Jesus is looking for people who will be such an expression of Himself that they can show an evil generation how Christ completely delivers from the dominion of sin. That sinners could see Christians who live above the lust and pleasure of this world. They could see men who love their wives and they're faithful. The wives who don't cheat but they're good mothers and keepers at home. Young people and students who practice purity and separation from everything that defiles. Let me tell you how I feel. We've had enough colleges named after famous evangelists. We've had enough fastest growing churches in the world. We've had enough busy Christians doing exploits. We've had enough gospel radio and television. Because if radio and television was ever going to do it, we've had 50 years to do it. And with all that, the less people knowing Christ and serving in fullness than any other generation. We've had enough of crusades and concerts and outreaches. We've had enough about abortion and moralism. 
We've had more than enough of plans and projects and programs and seminars and books and records and tapes, magazines and newsletters. But we don't have enough Christians who truly express who the Lord is. There are very few that, can, that sinners can point to and say, there goes a Christian who really expresses to me who Jesus is. If I ever come to Christ, that's the kind I want to be. There goes one who has nothing to sell, nothing to promote, nothing to prove but Christ risen and glorified. There stands a man, there stands a woman who shines with the beauty and simplicity of Jesus Christ as Lord. There's one who has reality. There's something in him and her I can't deny. That's Christ. And shouldn't that be the goal of your life and mine if that's God's intention? Shouldn't that be ours? That we would represent Christ in His fullness and completeness. And when I stand before the judgment seat of Christ, I'm going to be judged on one criterion alone. David, how did you express me to the world? What did your life say to the world about who Christ was? Did you show forth Christ through defilement and compromise and shamefulness? Could the sinner see an overcoming Christ in you? Or did you show them nothing of the fullness, the joy, and the victory of Christ the Lord? You're going to be judged on how you've represented Him, what kind of an expression you've been of Jesus Christ the Lord. That's awesome. You're going to stand before the Lord and brag how many souls you've won? Lord, I, I got 200 souls last year. You're going to stand before Him, Pastor, and tell Him that you built one of the biggest churches in America? You're going to tell Him how many stations you're on? And I'm not putting that down. You're going to tell Him what kind of crusade you started? What kind of moral victories you've won? How many people you've preached to? You see, God doesn't care so much about what you've done, but what you've become. That's the greatest thing the Lord's ever shown me. He's not, cons he's not interested in my winning all the world for Him, but winning all of me for Him. Hmm. Have you ever, has there ever been a day when there have been more works, more projects, more programs, and so few living in union with Christ as today? Before I close tonight, I want to list to you for you, some of the things that will help you become the full expression of Jesus Christ. I'm going to list about 11. Don't write them down, please, because I want your good ear and I want your eye right this way. I'm going to go too fast for you to write. First of all, listen close and give me your good ear now. Christ's shed blood washes you completely before the eyes of a holy God. Do you believe that? Christ's blood washes you completely before the eyes of a holy God. Number two, everything that could rise up against you and condemn you has been removed. Do you believe that? What's it been removed by? The sacrifice of Jesus. Third, God has never lost his satisfaction in what Christ did, and he's never going to lose his satisfaction in me because I'm in him. Do you believe that? Do you think God can ever be dissatisfied with what Christ has done? Then how could he ever be dissatisfied with me because I'm in him? For through his cross, Christ has removed everything that stood between me and him, and nothing can ever separate me again. Nothing will ever separate us from the love of God. Do you believe that? Here it is. Number five, his divine power has given to you, he's given you his divine power more surely than he gave it to the man with the palsy. He gave his power, Christ's power, was given to the man with the palsy. He's given that to you if by faith you would accept it. Six, God has seen your weakness, your helplessness, and he says to you, I'm going to snap it. I'm going to crush it. I'm going to overpower it. I'm going to do everything necessary to put away and make you superior to one thing that crippled you. The bed you laid in, you're going to carry. And I've got what I call a cookie jar theology. What does the parent do when the little child keeps stealing the cookies and gets spanked and spanked? The little child still climbs up. What's the parent do? He puts the cookie jar out of reach. Simple as that. There comes a time. You say, I can't handle my sin, Lord. And you love him. Your heart goes out to him. Lord says, I'm going to take it. I'm going to crush it. I'm going to put the cookie jar out of reach. I'm going to take that thing out of your life completely. I'm going to put it a million miles away. I'm going to make you strong at this point. Right here now. Not that you'll still be struggling for the cookies. I'm going to move the cookie jar. When I move the cookie jar, I'm going to take the desire for cookies away from you. God's going to make us stronger at that point. Hallelujah. 
Well, you still here? Number seven, his strength is going to be applied where you are the weakest. You become strong at that point. Number eight, Christ's one great desire for you is that he himself will shine through you, making you a beautiful expression to the whole world of who he is. God will not support anything that is not an expression of him anymore. Number nine, we must live now totally dependent on Christ. Do you remember the good Samaritan? What did he do? He put the wounded man on his own beast. And that's the hardest thing God has to do. Get us off our legs onto the beast. We like the oil and wine poured in, but we want to walk our own way to the end. Get it? He put him on his own beast. You're going to walk on his back. He's going to carry you. You're not going to walk on your own legs. And the most important thing God ever taught me to get me off my own legs. Number 10, there's only one choice you and I have, and not two. And that choice is communion above service. There was a time I got all my delight out of service. Now I get it out of communion. And the man who delights in service will work and work until he gets burned out. And the God will create a crisis in his life or allow one to be created that information won't get him out of. He has to have revelation. God in his love. And the, past, the young man who preached last night brought that out so clearly. He does it in so many lives. Sometimes after 20, 30 years, some of you are having it done to you right now. Do you remember... Remember what I said, there's only one choice, there are not two, there's only one, there's no alternative, it's communion, and communion is simply a common mind with the Lord, a common mind with the Lord, that you are seated in heavenly places, and it's there that you get the mind of Christ, then you come down to this world, and you minister as coming from a heavenly place, you come as a heavenly man, or a heavenly woman, detached from this world, totally in the mind of Christ, so that what you do, God can support the Bible said, if, if, it, if it said Mary chose the better part, that would mean that there were two parts, uh, better and best. No, the Bible says Mary has chosen the good part. There's only one. That's the good. That's the communion. No other way. There were no two. It doesn't say she chose the better part. She chose the good part, the only part, communion. Number 11, and here's the most important. If we are his bride and he's coming back soon, Shouldn't the greatest object of our lives be affection? Are you in the bride? Is the bridegroom coming back? Then what should be our object? Power alone? Or should it be love? Affection. Affection. If you love me, you'll obey me. I'm going to close with a personal word. I don't like to do this often, but I want to show you something about his presence. I'll tell you something. I started preaching when I was 14. And about three years ago, God shut me down. Really shut me down. And it's, it's almost shameful that a man, after 25 years of preaching, has to say to you, you know, I really didn't know him like I should. I hadn't seen him, the right hand of the Father. I haven't. I wasn't holding the head as I should. I didn't know I was the body, part of the body. I didn't know the responsibility I had to be an expression of Christ. I thought if I just stayed busy and worked for him, witnessed, that was it. The service comes out of communion. The service comes out of knowing him. That way there's no sweat. Because in the Holy of Holies, the priest couldn't wear anything that caused sweat. And the Lord will not allow sweat in his presence. And God had to shut me down to wipe all the sweat off my brow. And about uh, a year ago, I started having the Holy Spirit lift me out of myself into the heavenlies. On one occasion, for five hours, a little prayer house just shut in with God. He took me out in the Spirit in a worship, a stream of worship. And I was racing through the universe, past the cosmos and the stars. And I turned to see the earth and it was just a speck in space. And I could feel the emptiness 
and the coldness because I was racing toward the judgment seat. And the Bible said on the judgment day there'll be no place to stand. And I had no place to stand. And that's going to be the, the most awesome thing that you have no ground to stand on except what you know of him and the intimacy you have with him. You'd better know him when you go. When that door opens, you're not to be afraid of the judgment seat of Christ. That's the moment of glory when he puts his arms around you. I, I've, over the lifetime, I've heard preachers so condemn me about the judgment seat of Christ. Oh, no, no, when you're under the blood and intimate with him, shouldn't that be the time if you know him that you walk in, he puts his arms around you saying, well done, good and faithful servant. The only works that are going to burn, we're all going to have some works that burn. And that was trying to be righteous through our own works. That's all he's talking about. But that's a time of rejoicing. And I was racing past the stars and the earth was just a speck in space. And I thought, oh God, that's everything that I hold dear is on that speck and soon it's going to vanish. It's just a speck in space. All my ministry, all that I've done over the years, my family, everything I've held dear, every material thing that's there, and suddenly it was vanishing. It's all going to be gone. And I'm going to be standing before Jesus. And you'd better know Him. You'd better be in union with Him because there's nothing left. Nothing. And oh, I began to, my heart began to rejoice. And I began to scream, Oh God, I have nothing. I've done nothing. Oh, thank God I know You. Oh, if I had known Him, there would have been an emptiness in my heart. And suddenly I was detached, split free from the world and in His presence. And then a few months ago, I was in Dallas preaching. I just finished and I just raised my hands and there was a beautiful spirit of worship. And I remember just saying, glory, honor, and praise. Glory and honor and praise. Glory and honor and praise. And suddenly I was caught in a stream because you see, Praise is an eternal stream. And when you worship and pray in the Spirit, you're caught in the same stream. You're in that stream of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob with Peter and Paul and the apostles in the early church the day of Pentecost. It's one endless stream. It's one circle of praise. And you're caught up in that circle. You're one. There's only one hallelujah. Last through eternity. You're caught in that one great hallelujah of praise. And I was swept away in the stream and I felt my body just leaving the earth. And I felt myself growing closer and closer. And suddenly I saw a light break through and I passed out. I just went out. I don't know how long it felt, maybe 20 minutes or so. I was in the presence of Jesus Christ. Most awesome thing I've ever experienced in my life. And you know, I've heard people say, will we know each other in heaven? That's a mute question. It doesn't mean a thing because you won't want to know anybody else. You won't want to see streets of gold. You won't want to see mansions. You won't even want to talk to Peter or Paul because in his presence is fullness, joy, and pleasures forevermore. And Christ was so all-encompassing. He was so glorious. He so filled the heart with ecstasy. I didn't want to see family. I wasn't thinking of wife or unsaved loved ones. My father who'd passed on. Christ was everything. He filled my mind. And you know, when you get to heaven, it's not an even static kind of ecstasy. It's an ever-expanded consciousness. Because when I got there into His presence, I didn't see His face, but the light. I became luminous. His light went right through me. And His light went through me. I became one with that light. I was in the very presence of the light of the universe. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. No fear and the glory and the ecstasy got higher and higher and higher. And you understand that all through eternity, it's not static, it's not level, but the glory of Christ and the revelation of who He is is ever expanding. He's going to expand our consciousness. And all through eternity, we're going to learn more and more of His glory and His grace. And we're going to get more glory as the, as the eons go by. Hallelujah. The ecstasy and the glory of being in His presence. Nothing else mattered. Christ was all in it all. And if you see that you're in heaven long before you go there. And if you don't have heaven in you now, you can forget it. You, the saints used to call a little glory to go to glory in. I'm in heaven now. I'm in a heavenly place in Christ Jesus by faith. I'm seated at the right hand of the Father. Hallelujah. And the words I administer to you now, they are life. They are life because they are His words from Christ Himself. Because He said, He is all glory. He is all honor. He is all praise. And when you are there, nothing else matters. Shouldn't that be 
the way it is now? Shouldn't he be all supreme? Shouldn't he be the center of our attraction? Should we not our hearts be going out to him? Shouldn't we hear the cry of the bride? Come, come, come. The bride and the spirit say, come. Shouldn't our hearts be going out to him? Shouldn't we be like Peter jumping out of the boat wanting to be with him? Shouldn't we be like Mary whose heart couldn't be consoled until she had her heart satisfied that he was alive? If you really love him, your heart's not going to be satisfied until you know him in his fullness. Hallelujah. You, you know, I, I've got to just say this before I close. If you're his bride, Christ has to be able to say to you, there's my friend. There's my friend. That's my bride. There's my affection. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her. The scripture said, he's the husband, we're the bride. And the heart of her husband does safely trust in her. I'm going to ask you that. Does he safely trust in you? Can he safely trust you that you're an expression of who he is now? In your ministry and what you're doing? Or is the flesh still in control? I don't know where he's taken me yet, but I don't want anything to do anymore with the secular, ecclesiastical world. I don't want anything to do with it anymore. I want to see the new man risen. I want to be in that man. God only sees one man. The church is one man, and that's Christ. And we and him. And I'm hungry. And I told the Lord recently, if you think Jacob wrestled, you haven't seen anything yet. And the one thing we're not giving him is time. How sad to preach in some of the biggest churches in America and have a pastor tell you he hasn't prayed in one year. To see men building buildings and body counts and ego tripping and it sounds like we don't even know him anymore. We don't know him. And we're so blind. So blind. My people have ears, but they don't hear. They have eyes, but they don't see. And their hearts are cold. You know, there were some things that Jesus said, even to the disciples, there's some things I'd like to show you, but you can't, you can't accept it. You can't understand. You can't comprehend. And I think it'd be a shame that we'd stand before God. And he'd say, there's some things I wanted to show you, but you weren't ready. I don't want that. I don't even want power. I want his love. And I want him. If I never see him do another thing, if he never answers another prayer, I don't care. I know he does the miraculous, and I believe we need that. Oh, yes, I do. And I believe he'll answer prayer. But that's not why I love him. I love him because I've seen him. And I've tasted of him. I just buried my business manager, 33 years old. Cancer of the liver. In the last two weeks before he died, I was with him every day. And all we did was talk about the glory. And Christ was revealing himself. And that young man at 33 saw more of Jesus than any evangelist I know in America. And he had preachers coming in and say, where's your faith? You know, where's the sin in your life? And all that garbage. And he said to me, David, if God heals me now, I'll be disappointed. Because I've touched the glory and I want to go to it. And when you've seen the glory, the world doesn't hold attraction anymore. And if you don't have what Paul right now had, a desire to be with him rather than be here, your number one desire should be with him. You know, there's, a, there's an old cliche, so heavenly you're no earthly good. Well, there's no such thing. The man who said that was backslid.